You're listening to A Book with Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book with Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the president and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. This is going to be fun. We are going to look at one of the strongest cocktails of private enterprise and government dreams colliding in U.S. history. Peter Stark is joining us to talk about his book, Astoria, John Jacob Astor, and Thomas Jefferson's Lost Pacific Empire. Peter Stark is an adventure and exploration writer and historian. He is also the author of of Young Washington, his 2018 book. A longtime correspondent for Outside Magazine, Stark's articles and essays have also appeared in The Smithsonian, The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Men's Journal, and many others. Astoria was also a New York Times bestseller, a finalist for a Penn USA Literary Award, and was adapted into an epic two-part play by Portland Center Stage in Portland, Oregon. On a personal note, I also just have to mention that Peter is our first cheesehead to join the podcast today. So, Peter, thank you for joining me. Well, I'm delighted to be your first cheesehead for sure. <laughs> I have a colleague here who is a fellow cheesehead, so uh, I say that in all, all, all loving ways. Um, so, Peter, this is an incredible American story in every sense of the phrase. I mean, to you know, talk about Thomas Jefferson and, and Lewis and Clark it, just in the same sentence and think about the West— well, I, my first question would be, what caused you to write this book? Well, it was sort of a random convergence of events. And the way I really got onto the story was uh, some years ago, I was working on a book uh, called, I call it my Blank Spots book. And what I did is t- took a, um, a satellite nighttime photo of the U.S., you know, from one of the big NASA satellites. And... Um, I looked where the lights were, and then I really focused on where the lights were not. And I went to several of those blank spots and profiled those areas, Um, you know, talked about their their history, their kind of exploration history, Um, you know, and then I had my own adventures there, hiking or canoeing, sometimes with my family. And one of those blank spots was southeastern Oregon. And um, I was driving down this long, lonely road in Oregon, and in southeastern Oregon, if, uh, I'm sure you've been there, um, that anybody who's been there knows it's, it's very much a blank spot in terms of population. It's extremely unpopulated. Mm-hmm. And so I was driving along, and it was, I don't know, it was like a main evening, and it was getting dark, and you know, there was no town forever. And you know, it was like, where am I gonna stay? You know, where am I gonna spend the night? Am I gonna sleep in the ditch or whatever? And I finally came to this little town called John Day, Oregon. And I spent the night there in you know, some, you know, some random motel. And the next morning I started thinking, what, John Day, that's a weird name for a town. So who's John Day? And I started doing research and it turned out John Day was one of the original historians. And he was this guy who had been through so many um, extraordinary experiences a number of them traumatic, um, as as you know from reading the book, and you know mm-hmm. he'd been, you know, dragged along having m- malaria. He'd been uh, uh, abandoned uh, in Hell's Canyon um, as he was starving, and his peers went on. He'd he'd uh, been helped by the Indians. He'd poisoned himself by eating the wrong kind of root in <laughs> the de- death camas instead of the good camas and uh and then he, and then ultimately he was uh he and his his buddy uh, Ramsey Crooks were 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 um 
taken by the Indians and stripped naked and told to run back to where they came from. And that was John Day. And I thought, wow, he's just he's just a single guy on this huge expedition. What you know, what what went on with these these guys? And so that's what got me into the Astoria story. But as as you say, it's you know, it's this it's a great word way to put it is cocktail is convergence of private and public enterprise and this whole visionary scheme in in what was then a very remote and wild part of the world from you know from from uh, the east coast eyes so you start your story off by you know introducing astor can you kind of give our listeners a sense of you know who astor was where he came from how he ended up and kind of how he made his money so um you know the i quiz people audiences when i give readings that you know the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, you know, and that's a, that's a famous brand now. And I quizzed mm-hmm. them. Do you know? Do you know what what Waldorf Astoria comes from? And I don't think I've ever had anybody who had the answer. Waldorf is the name of the tiny town in Germany from which John Jacob Astor left as a 17 year old son of a butcher who decided he didn't have a whole lot of future in this little town, and he. Um, ended up going to England. He was, you know, really enterprising and very focused. And he had an older brother who was in England uh, involved in the musical instrument business. And so young John Jacob went to England and spent four years there learning English and working for his brother. And he was really waiting for the, um, you know, the real land of opportunity to open up that the Revolutionary Revolutionary War was still going on at that time in the in the U.S. and what was then going to be the U.S. and so he waited for the the, the you know the the Treaty of Paris the Peace of Paris um, was 1783 and right after that he emigrated to uh, um, America and on board the ship he met uh, a fur trader who said you can make a lot of money buying furs in in North America and and selling them in Europe if you have the right connections. And John Jacob had thought that he was actually going to be a musical instrument dealer, um, you know, in the same line of work as his brother. And he he brought with him on this on the ship. uh, He had a satchel, as as the story is told, in which there were seven flutes, these finely made flutes. So that was his working capital, which is I mean, this plays in exactly to what we're talking about, about investment and, and vision. He had in this satchel, these seven really well-crafted flutes. And that was going to be, you know, his capital when he got to the, the new world, to America. And that when he got there, he started putting together this combination of selling his flutes, his, uh, finely made, finely crafted musical instruments from the old world, from Europe, where they're, you know, fine craftsmen, and selling them in, in, in the just created United States, where there were not fine musical instruments or fine musical instrument craftsmen, and he could sell them at a, at a premium, of course, because they just weren't available. And at the same time, he started buying uh, furs from, you know, from wild animals that, 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 uh, traders and uh, trappers and, uh, t- uh, you know, wilderness traders who, who traded with, with the Indians in various more remote locations would bring back to New York and um, he'd buy those furs and he'd ship them to Europe. And at that point, of course, I mean, for almost forever, that that uh, furs were in really prestigious prestigious high demand in Europe and fetched a huge premium there. So, you know, it was kind of a brilliant scheme importing the, 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 you know, the finely made musical instruments from Europe to the new world and, and exporting um, the new world wild animal furs to the old world. So he opened up, uh, here's the bizarre thing. When you think about like an investor, he opened up a, uh, a fur and musical instrument shop in Manhattan in the 1780s hmm. with the help of his wife. And um, it it took off. 
basically. And it was due to his inner enterprise. And he, he would go out, you know, he eventually started traveling way to, uh, to the upstate New York and to, you know, to wilderness, semi-wilderness locations and buying, buying furs from, from Indian hunters. And, um, and he built his business and built his business. And then his wife was one of the early, from one of the early Dutch families in Manhattan. And I always like to think his, his wife said, you know, we should invest in real estate because, you know, this little settlement has grown even in, you know, in my, in my family's history by quite a lot and it's going to keep growing. So, um, that's what I like to think happened, but they, they did, they were in business together and they did invest very early in, in New York real estate on the proceeds of their, um, fur and musical instrument business. And, one of the first properties they bought is what's called then and is called now is Greenwich Village, a, a, a rural property. Mm. Yeah. So in, in in your book, I mean, you very much teach your your readers that um, Waldorf uh, was uh, uh, or him coming from Waldorf and Astor coming to the New World. He was very enterprising right out of the gate. Um, he very much had a vision of where he wanted to be. I think you told a story about him, you know, picking out the house that he wanted to um, have someday. Um, what caused him to look west? In other words, you know, there's this tie to the furs, but um, you you teach some during in your book um, about him going to Montreal and kind of looking west all along. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question um, and and a great observation on your part that that he was. W- one of you know, I think relatively few people in in the U.S. at that time who could look way west, and you know, of course, there were a lot of settlers who were looking maybe as far as the Appalachian Mountains or maybe a little over the Appalachian Mountains um, as quote the west. But uh, Astor, due to his fur trading travels, and as a relatively young man, had gone up to Montreal on several occasions and to do business and that's where the 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 big um, you know british based fur companies were or british empire based fur companies um he he did a lot of business with with uh the northwest company which had you know they were scottish they were highland scots who had come to to canada basically and you know these are really tough guys who could you know establish these fur posts way 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 out in the in the in the wilderness, and so the Northwest Company had fur posts um, all the way um, you know up to the Upper Great Lakes and beyond the Upper Great Lakes, all, you know almost to the Rocky Mountains, which was so much farther than than any any kind of enterprise in the U.S. extended at that point. I mean way beyond. And so Astor, at one point, and so it's it's believed, made a trip, you know, in these huge Voyager canoes, up the up the you know up the the, the, the various rivers and Great Lakes, all the way to the western edge of Lake Superior, where there was a place called Fort Williams, which was the huge Northwest Company Scottish fur trading kind of epicenter. And on the basis of that, I, I you know I think he really started. Thinking of the the of you know America the U S he started thinking of the continent and and the and the really the sweep of the continent and how far west it went and what could be out there and the potential for for trade and even even started thinking about the West Coast which was really unusual at that time. In this, you know, Jefferson sends out like you talked about you know he he buys he does the Louisiana Purchase in eighteen oh three. He then sends out Lewis and Clark from 1804 to 1806, um, which was, you know, the, the first people to head west. Um, and then Astor starts talking to President Jefferson uh, in 1808 to kind of begin planning and, and kind of start this public-private kind of partnership. Um, did you find this very interesting? I mean, yes, government had involvement. Uh, for example, the Northwest Company had blessing. Um, the Hudson Bay had, had blessing. Um, you know, from government as well, in that case, the British government. Um, did, did you find this interesting for the history of the United States to have such a tight knit between the president and a private enterprise like this? Oh, I thought it was totally fascinating. And I, I still do. And, and I, you know, we can kick this around. To, we don't have to do it right now. But that, that, you know, how does that play out today compared to how, does, how did it play out then? 
that that one of the things a key factor here was that that like Astor, I mean, or, or actually way before Astor, Jefferson also had that vision to the West, and you know he was a Virginia from a Virginia plantation family, and his father was a surveyor who did some of the very early Western surveying over the over the Blue Ridge Mountains. So he had a, a very much a Western orientation and was very curious about what lay way out west. And of course, eventually got the Louisiana Purchase, as you say, and, and he sent Lewis and Clark. And uh, they came back in uh, 1806. And very soon after that, Jefferson received a letter from uh, John Jacob Astor in New York um, saying, in effect, I believe I can capture the commercial enterprise of one quarter of the globe, this whole quarter of the globe, um, with an idea I have uh, for the fur trade. And uh, Jefferson uh, arranged for him to meet at the, at the White House in Washington. And together, they essentially brainstormed this idea. And I've just so would have loved to have a fly on the wall recording of what went on in that room at that time. There are some secondhand um, accounts of it, but not, you know, not a, a word by word, dialogue by dialogue, you know, speaker by speaker account. And that, that it, it's, but it's clear that they really fed off of each other. Their visions fed off of each other. And it was a, brainstorming session that President Jefferson and John Jacob Astor, a New York businessman, had in the in the Oval Office, in the White House. And um, Jefferson was known for being way into maps and that there are stories of Jefferson un unrolling maps on the floor of his of the president's office and, you know, cr crawling around on the floor with the you know, pointing out places on the map. So I like to think of Jefferson and Astor doing that um, together. And but they were both real visionaries who could see over the horizon, and they could see what the West Coast potentially could be. Of course, the Louisiana Purchase extended uh, from the Mississippi River to the crest of the Rocky Mountains to the Continental Divide, essentially. So that still left this enormous chunk of terrain between the crest of the Rockies and the Pacific coast. And that was essentially a big no man's land. You know, of course, there were hundreds of Indian tribes there. But, you know, in, in Western, you know, territorial eyes, that was a big no man's land. And um, Jefferson, um, that Astor saw the commercial possibilities of that huge swath of the West Coast. I think it was almost 2,000 miles long, this this you know, kind of unclaimed swath of the West Coast that went from the northernmost um, Spanish settlements, which were around, uh, you know, a mission around um, San Francisco uh, uh, Bay Area. And uh, there was one lone Russian fur outpost uh, way down in kind of what's now the Alaska panhandle. So between those two, there were, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds, I think about 2,000 miles of, of sort of unclaimed land. Jefferson... Uh, saw this. He understood that. That was one of the reasons he, he sent Lewis and Clark there. And Astor understood it as a potential huge commercial empire that would bring in the Pacific Ocean into into his trading scheme, the way the Atlantic Ocean was sort of a center of trade um, in, in those days, especially between Europe and North America and South America. He had a vision for the Pacific. And um, Jefferson, in uh, a way that's so relevant to what we're talking about in terms of a public-private partnership, Jefferson realized that the, the U.S. government could not undertake this enterprise alone. It was too much to um, bring that whole West Coast area and all its, its, its potential commerce into the fold of the, the U.S., he hoped, um, the Jefferson hoped, and if if not that, uh, he saw it as its own, he called it um, empire of liberty, that huge swath of the West Coast, and he hoped that democracy would thrive there, 
and and one day you know liberty democracy would would thrive there and one day it would start spreading from the west coast towards the center of the continent as as the idea of liberty and democracy spread um, from the east coast towards the center of the continent and they would join together jefferson and astor had this vision and saw this um, public private partnership which i think has so many resonances today and what how to harness that how to harness it basically they, they saw what they could do yeah to your point um i think a lot about you know what's going on where you know people are by, uh, blasting private rockets into space right now and we think of what nasa used to be versus the partnership to your point that the government has with business um so so let's pivot because i think that that's a very interesting theme but I want to pivot to another really interesting theme that I drew away from your book, um, how Astor sets up the Pacific Fur Company. So he you know, sets out this plan. He's going to send one party um, you know, out around Cape Horn. Um, he also is going to send the Overland Party that, that obviously much of your book is about these two parties. Um, but right before that, he sends off uh, the Enterprise um, to start kind of doing this you know, global sea route um, that you talked about. But to get these trappers and some of these Scotsmen um, that you highlighted in your book, um, he actually sets up a stock corporation, backs it with capital, and hands out incentive via stock. Um, w- was that just the capitalist he was and how he thought about incentivizing people around him? I, I think so. That, that he worked um, in somewhat partnership uh, in other uh, areas before that, he, he had a way of bringing in the people who worked for him closely, uh, you know, in more closely as partners. So, yes, I think he was trying to incentivize these these Scottish fur traders up in Montreal and these, uh, you know, the French voyageurs. Well, he would, didn't offer the French voyageurs the stock, but, the, but, you know, he was trying to recruit the big Scottish fur traders and the educated Scottish clerks to take part in this enterprise. But what happened is was he offered these, these you know, like stock certificates up in Montreal to try to recruit people. And the Scottish guys just laughed at him. He said, well, you, you're joking, you know. This, there's no way this is going to work. And But eventually he convinced enough people to take part in this, essentially the best and the brightest of, of that whole fur trade, um, or, or at least some of the best and the brightest of that whole fur trade. He, he really wanted to hire experts, and that's very much a prominent theme that runs through this whole um, uh, you know, era and his whole uh, business life, is that he, for this kind of visionary enterprise he wanted the best he wanted the experts so he he hired who he th- the guy who thought it was the you know the best ship captain he could find he hired the you know the best scottish fur traders he could come up with um so he was very that was very much in his mind people were a big dynamic kind of thematically um in this story um you're right that he was looking for experts i i the other thing i drew out of your book though is experts aren't always friends and experts aren't always people that like working together. Um, so I think there's kind of a, you know, I'll call it of a, a business culture truth or, you know, your team building. Um, can you teach the listeners how, you know, the, the fur traders interacted with, you know, uh, you know, the, the Thorn, who was the ship captain, the Tonkin, and how all that went down as they set out to go around Cape Horn together? Well, the short answer to that is very poorly. And I mean, it just makes me laugh when you bring up the question because there's so much there, and it's, I mean it's just crazy the 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 dysfunction that goes on aboard the ship, the Tonkin, um, that um, so that there were basically two or th- three or even more very different cultures at work, uh, especially on this ship that was sent around on a twenty five thousand mile voyage from New York Harbor around um, Cape Horn out to Hawaii and then back to the West Coast at the mouth of the Columbia River. And so you had one, uh, Captain Thorne, who was um, a Yankee sea captain, former Navy guy, and um, and had been a big hero in the um, the war against the Barbary pirates, which is its own crazy thing um, in the early 1800s. 
Um, and Astor would ref- refer to Captain Thorne as his gunpowder man. And that Thorne was known for his incredible bravery and, you know, sailing right into the line of fire in, the, in this war against the Barbary pirates. And so Astor, it, his thinking, I think, basically went, okay, this is a really dicey enterprise. It could be intercepted by the British, by the French, by the Spanish, by, you know, any number of potentially hostile powers. I want someone who knows how to defend himself and defend my enterprise and defend a, a ship. And so he hired Thorne, who's this 30-year-old guy, except extremely rigid. Um, and he has uh, his own sailors who, who come aboard with him, and they're, in, they're a, sort of a Yankee uh, orientation. In fact, they are. They're all from New England. And he's uh, this very straightforward guy and believes in military discipline and and uh, everything's done according to regulation and code and uh, rules. And so then on the same ship, you have these Scottish fur traders, these guys who are, you know, they love sitting around at fire and smoking their pipes and telling stories and drinking whiskey and hanging out. And, you know, it's not like they have a lot of rules and regulations about how they interact with each other. And that at the same time, you also have um, the, the, the kind of the workhorses of the fur trade, the French voyageurs, the French Canadian voyageurs, who are these guys, I, you know, I've, I, I think I refer to them in the book as the wilderness hippies of their era, you know, that they're Mm -hmm. these really strong, tough guys who paddle canoes for, you know, for thousands of miles. And they're, but they're really kind of free, free living. And, you know, they make some money and then they go blow it. And, you know, they, they have multiple dogs and, you know, many wives over the course of their lives. And it's just kind of live for the moment guys. So you have all these different cultures packed aboard this, tiny, you know, this ship that's like 100 feet long. Everything's jammed in there, you know, all the supplies for settlement and all these people. And things turn south within about four hours after they leave New York Harbor when Thorne tell, Captain Thorne tells the Scottish fur traders and the young Scottish clerks, the educated young clerks, um, and I'm, I'm sure the French voyageurs were involved. To, okay, you know, it's 8 o'clock, lights out, military discipline, everybody off deck, you know, put out your pipes, go to bed. And and the Scottish fur traders say no. And he says yes, and they say no. And he says, you do it now. And they say, well, we own part of this enterprise, so this is our ship, and we can do what we want to on our ship. Mm-hmm. And I think that's at the point where, you know, Thorne pulls off the his pistol and says he does this at some point i think here but he says the next person to disobey my orders i'll blow his brains out and that sort of set the tone for the voyage right there so here's the as you say the contrast in the and uh conflict within the you know so-called working groups aboard this little ship that there were very different cultures and it was six months of pure clash and incredibly dramatic stories of 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 how they uh, Thorne tried to abandon some of them on a, on a very kind of deserted island, and it, it goes on and on and on. They were all really good at their craft, though, which was interesting. Um, to your point about Thorne being, you know, he was on, I think you mentioned he was on leave from the Navy, in effect, at this time, and you have these outstanding trappers. So let, let's pivot to the Overland Party now. Um, you know, uh, you have William Price Hunt and, and, and Donald McKenzie taking out kind of through the traditional Northwest Passage out through, um, you talk about Mackinac Island. When I was reading Mackinac Island, I grew up in Seattle and Mackinac Island reads like Seattle was during the Klondike Gold Rush. It was kind of a boom town with everything from drugs and alcohol and, and you know, anything under the sun uh, as long as people were making money. Well, it was a boom town. It was kind of like a gold rush boom town, you know. They sometimes they called these furs, and especially the sea outer furs, which they were after on the west coast, that were so valuable. They called them black gold. So mm. there was this kind of commercial frenzy, and at the same time, it was a uh, really remote outpost. But there were cultures coming in from all over the place, and there were you know many different Indian tribes would would come there to trade. Um, you have the voyageurs coming through. You have the um, the, the uh, Scottish fur traders. You know, originally there was a the um, it was a Jesuit outpost um, to 
uh, I mean, it was an Indian outpost way before that, but a Jesuit um, priest, you know, set up a mission there way, way back when. Um, and so on this island, you have, again, all these c- cultures coming together, and it's and this small settlement, and it's just a crazy place. You know, there are grog shops every which way, and they're, um, you know, uh, it's just kind of like a, you know, party town. And for these, you know, the voyagers and the trappers coming in from the wilderness. And um, the, this Wilson Price Hunt is the head of, the, as you mentioned, the Overland Party. And so he shows up with his, you know, maybe I think they're like 10 guys um, mm. in, in the voyageur canoe. And he tries to recruit more um, voyageurs for this, this journey west. And, you know, essentially a journey into the unknown virtually. And that he can't get anybody to come along. You know, the voyageurs say, oh, no, you know, that's that's kind of ridiculous. Um, And then, you know, you talk about incentivizing something. So one of the, um, I think it's one of the fur traders uh, who has lots of experience working with these voyageurs says, you know, these guys are real dandies. You know, they they love to dress up and show off. Mm. And they love nothing more than a big, you know, floofy feather in their cap, literally. And that the, uh, the, the, uh, supply among the supplies that Wilson Price Hunt brought for trade goods, I think probably, um, designated for the Indians, but were big floozy. I think they were peacock feathers. And so the Hunt and his, and his, uh, Scottish fur traders, started handing out a, uh, one of these big floozy peacock feathers to any French Canadian voyageurs who would sign up for the voyage West. And that, that, that brought them in. And it also, he had to knock back the, 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 uh, uh, the term, you know, the time, the term they had to sign up for from five years, he knocked it back. I think it was down to two and a half. And so between the feather and the shorter term that brought these guys in. So they get the voyageurs to your point in with, you know, I mean, they're kind of flooring luxury goods to these people. I I kind of thought of it as these people want to go into the Gucci store and they want to go into the Louis Vuitton store and they want to kind of be flashy. But 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 to your point, below the waist, they look like they're trappers. They have moccasins on. They have loincloths, uh, you know, or, or, or pants more like the natives were wearing. So then they go to St. Louis to try to recruit some Americans and they just hear the deftest no that, that they could possibly get. And your book made it sound like it had a lot to do with the problems of the last few parties that had gone west. Yeah, the previous party that had gone up the Missouri River to establish a fur trade way up the Missouri River had gone up, I think it was maybe a year earlier, and no one had come back. And so people in St. Louis were saying, what what happened to those guys? You know, they just disappeared into thin air. So there wasn't a lot of uh, incentive to go... <laughs> be the next party that disappears into thin air. And so that's what they, the, the Hunt's Overland Party ran into in St. Louis when they were trying to recruit. So then the Tonkin, uh, they get out to the Columbia River mouth, which is a pivotal moment because they're finally west. Um, you know, after going around Cape Horn, going to Hawaii, dealing with King Kamehameha, um, and they get to the, the mouth, and now Thorne, as this leader, this rigidity that you pointed out, um, is sending people to their grave just to find the mouth of the Columbia River. So two things. Could you explain to listeners how dangerous that waterway is? I've been across the, the, the bar there. It is even today, it's still a dangerous waterway. But could you explain the danger there? And then secondly, um, the kind of, the kind of uh, weather and atmosphere they were entering on top of the danger of that waterway. Yeah, so that's you know been one of the most dangerous river mouths in the world, and essentially you have all the force of the Columbia River, which is has a massive flow of water pushing out, and you have the entire force of the Pacific Ocean pushing in the the huge waves, the tides, the winds, and where the two meet, they meet at this place called the Columbia Bar, which is a sandbar four miles long or so that runs across the mouth of the Columbia River. So to get from the ocean into the river, you know, into the calm water, you've got to get over this bar. And, you know, it was a phenomenally dangerous process. Um, There's 
always a one channel in there somewhere where the river water actually runs out. And so Thorne was sending these, you know, essentially these rowboats with with uh, you know fur traders and sailors in them to go row around over this bar, you know, to sound the water to try to find this passage. And I, I think there were ultimately, I think it was eight or nine of these of his guys of these guys to drown trying to find the the, the, the bar. So it's, you know, Thorne, it was almost like he brought his military discipline and tell these guys, well, you know, you're, you guys are marching into the face of the fire. Go, you know, go. <laughs> here's the rowboat. Go find the mouth of the bar, which is, a, you know, here's a whole different culture uh, colliding with the Columbia River bar. Very dangerous. Um, you know, there's a lot of tragedy that takes place for both the Overland Party and, as you're pointing out, um, you know, for the Tonkin and tragedy was just a central theme. Um, you talked about exposure, which I thought was a wonderful point. You know, exposure, you, you use the analogy of, a, of a, a mountain climber and these people were completely exposed on their own. And yet the incentives were very large. Um, I think you point out in your book that uh, uh, Astor learns what happens to the Tonkin eventually and its demise in 1812. Um, but even so, the enterprise that headed out earlier still made a king's ransom in that global trade. Um, can you give us a sense in today's dollars how much money they were taking in and, and how big that could have potentially been to Astor personally? Oh, I mean, it, would, it could have been enormous. And, and I mean, one of the points that I, I should have made earlier is that Astor's, Astor's vision was global. I mean, essentially sending these ships around the world with uh, taking trade goods to the West Coast, picking up furs on the West Coast, taking the furs to China where they could get a huge price, getting tea and porcelain in China, bringing those back around to Europe. It was a circumglobal vision. And had it succeeded, his the, the first ship he sent off to do that did succeed. And, and it made, you know, it would have been worth, I don't know, to, in today's dollars, I would guess, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars by, you know, by comparison, um, mm -hmm. if he if he had succeeded, I mean, you know, you're talking about enterprises the size of like, um, you know, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, you know, that that sort of game changing scale um, of of enterprise. Um, Henry Ford, you know, um, uh, you know, John D. Rockefeller, massive, massive. And yet, in the end, um, this whole empire did end up getting sold. And it kind of clashed ultimately with, you know, back to this earlier idea of public private, you know, partnership. Um, in effect, the British government came in the way uh, via uh, the Northwest Company and they had to sell out um, out of pure, you know, force. Out, out of pure force. And I, I th that was one of the huge, not one, it was the huge disappointment for Astor. I mean, despite all this tragedy and loss of life that was incurred in the, especially in the early going, that that once the the war of 1812 broke out, it, which happened, broke out on the essentially on the East Coast in the middle of, uh, as Astor was trying to establish his enterprise on the West Coast, that made his outpost, Astoria, on the West Coast, um, on the West Coast, uh, potentially a a a prize of war, meaning the British could just go take it, you know, according to the rules of war, and the Northwest Company very much wanted that post. It was very valuable. Um, and so Astor was begging the U.S. government, and this was, uh, at this point, it was Jefferson had left office and James uh, Madison was the, the president. He was begging the U.S. government and the Secretary of War and James Madison to send, an, you know, all he needed was a single armed ship to go to the West Coast to defend his enterprise. And he he tried so hard to do that, and the, but the U.S. government would not send a ship to defend the West Coast. And I suspect if Jefferson had been in office, he would have sent the ship. Madison did not have the same westward vision that, that Jefferson did, and Madison felt he needed the ship up on the Great Lakes to fight up there. So ultimately, it was the British government that that kind of put forward the resources to, to go take this post on the West Coast in the U.S., that even though despite Jefferson's commitment to give all the help that Astor would need to establish this post, the U.S. essentially didn't come through on its commitment. You pointed out 
um, Aster, you know, the money was not the issue with Aster, but the lives lost in this story were, were very large. I think you mentioned that of the people that, that didn't, didn't live, um, 40% died a brutal death. It was, it was not, you know, quiet. It was shocking. So I, I kind of walked away from the book thinking about this idea of this, this capitalism, this enterprise. And at the same time, there's human tragedy and, and damage, uh, to, to a lot of human lives. And, and I bring that up because as I sit back in today's world in 2022, we're kind of having a, a national debate on a similar level, which is there's been a lot of wealth built up in very large technology companies. And much like that, the question might be asked, uh, is this good for us as individuals? Is this good for people? And, you know, walking away from learning about this story, did you have those same feelings in looking at Aster? Um, and and the damage that was kind of wrought on the people that got involved in his sphere. Yeah, that's such a good question, and it has so much resonance today. That it, um, if it had succeeded, it would have been, but because it failed in its in various ways, it succeeded in some ways in establishing this first American outpost on the West Coast. But in terms of in a commercial sense, it failed, and the loss of life incredible. So what what strikes me about that is that that you know when you're joining a technology company, you know, if you're throwing your your lot in with a technology company in the startup phase or whatever, it's not like your life is on the line from from exposure to cold and starvation, which is mm. what was happening. I mean, it, you know, it can be, you know, if you were in some really difficult dire circumstance in some really poor country, but but for the you know vast majority of people joining a, a big technology company, it's it's a, a financial risk as opposed to a risk to one's life. And, you know, as you point out, there are incredible storms and hard winter and battering storms on the on this West Coast in this area. And so that 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 was the risk. And looking back at that era, I'm so struck by the the that the level of risk that people were willing to take, I mean, with their lives, with their lives and for a, for a commercial enterprise. And I think some of it was because they had a personality that wanted to do an adventurous thing, but it, it, you know, in terms of investing capital, you know, if you're putting your life on the line, that's a whole different level. So that's why I'm, I don't, you know, it's, I think it's hard in, in that way to draw the parallel with today's technology companies, in the in the 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 scale of the investment that these these historians were putting on on the line, but I think on the uh, by the same token, there's that dynamic where there is a driven visionary boss guy in charge, and who will make this succeed at whatever the cost, or virtually whatever the cost, and there's. You know, there's there's collateral damage to people along the way for sure. Uh, you know, there's also benefits to a lot of people, but but a lot of people get run over in one way or the other, or smaller companies get run over. So, yeah, I don't basically, I don't think that that whatever you know, some massive growing technology company that growth is good for its own sake, but it's, I think it's, uh, you know, like in Astor's case, it's a matter of how you do it. And, and the kind of growth that you're willing to encourage. And how do you take care of those people who are with you on this, on this journey? It's, so it's, it's, a, it's almost a matter of, of, of method and, and process as opposed to concept in itself. Analogously, uh, just like Aster handed out stock, um, to your point, the technology companies do that too. It's you know restricted stock units. So it's interesting also that there's very similar incentive structures being handed out. Um, I loved this book because I think I might have mentioned this before the podcast, but you mentioned John Day. I've been to the John Day Dam numerous times. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Seattle area but have relatives in Portland. So as you talked about Deer Island and places like that in your story, um, I felt like my parts of my childhood came to life. They partied in Walla Walla when they finally, uh, you know, got got up 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 the Walla Walla River. And and I went to college in Walla Walla, and I partied in Walla Walla too. So so um, so like I said, this was I, I think this is just a great story of the West. You know, outside of kind of some of these bigger themes and topics of 
people and capital and incentives. Um, it, it's a great story of the West. If, if you know, I think to myself, if someone's you know from other parts of the country, your book can all kind of make them dream, and then they should get in a motorhome and start traveling and uh, do exactly what you did in Southeast Oregon. Yeah, I mean, it's when you come across that kind of story, there's so many of them out there, and you know the incredible uh, adventures and and people had and the risks they took, and you know, and especially you know those those pioneering days of the early fur trade. And then, you know, there's a whole other story about the native tribes who, who lived there and, you know, the, you know, incredibly uh, heroic things that happened on that side of the equation too, as they were getting pushed and pushed and pushed. And um, so there's, there's so many stories out there and I continue to be fascinated by them. I, I, these days I call myself an adventure, an adventure historian, meaning I go <laughs> looking for history with a lot of adventure in it. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 this was a great read. Um, it, there's so much, and I, I, it, it, I wish we had more time. I was going to ask you, uh, is there anything else that we haven't talked about or a theme out of the book that you think is really important um, that we might have missed? Well, I think a really important theme, and especially what, what we're talking about, you know, when, if you're talking about the um, parallels in today's uh, business world and investing world, is the, the different leadership styles that each segment of the uh, expedition had. And so there, I define it as there were three very different leadership styles. And one, you had Captain Thorne, who was this, you know, rigid disciplinarian and, and, but utterly fearless. Um, And then you had, but but it was very difficult for him to adjust to changing circumstances and to, you know, to the, to human interaction. And then you had uh, Wilson Price Hunt, who led the Overland Party. And, you know, he was this young 27-year-old, I think he, he was. He was, a, he was a businessman and a really nice guy. And he totally led by consensus, yet he didn't know what he was doing. And so that caused all sorts of issues, too, that he he tried to bring everybody into the decisions. And um, there were that that worked sometimes and other times it it, it kind of backfired um, that there wasn't enough kind of drive that he put into that overland expedition to get them over the mountains before winter set in. And that was the big issue. They got caught in the Rocky Mountains when winter set in and they you know, essentially ran out of food and it was really an awful situation. Then the third leadership style was um, uh, uh, McDougal, who was one of the Scottish fur traders. And he kind of by default, I mean, he sort of had a a, a letter from Astor saying, well, if nobody else is in charge, you're in charge of the West Coast, um, you know, settlement, the West Coast outpost. And so McDougal took that letter and really ran with it. And he set himself up as this kind of king of the, of the, of the West Coast and, um, and was this really, uh, you know, self-serving kind of devious, uh, uh, um, looking out for himself and maximum profit, um, and he had various, I mean, crazy devices that he used to to uh, ensure that he'd survive, you know, among them, you know, threatening, holding up a little vial, a glass vial, and telling the Indians it was full of smallpox, and unless they did as he said, he'd let it loose and they'd all die. Um, so, you know, he was operating on, on that kind of term. Um, so you had these three very different leadership styles, and the you know which which one was best i would say some of everyone was best and and not all of any of them so it would it was almost a matter of like which style did you need in which particular moment in which particular situation that the leader who would have done best would have been one who could in a way switch switch th- thematically between those different styles as as necessary and none of them could curiously i think mcdougall was the guy who probably came out best the the most devious one because he ended up uh, selling out astor in the end to the british and 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 yet being made uh you know making a fair amount of money and being made a partner in the in the in the next british em, uh, enterprise of course the rumor was or the story is that you know some years later he died a a brutal death up in canada so you know i guess the lesson is he his style didn't work out all that well either. 
Wonderful point. Uh, Peter, I've really enjoyed our time today, um, as I'm sure our listeners have. I can't help but think uh, your work should teach us that m money incentives don't necessarily make everything work uh, when people are, are especially exposed, like you pointed out. Um, our human need to survive can cause things that may be unexpected. And a lot of the characters in your story um, saw unexpected things and then in, in response did unexpected things. I love the book. This is an outstanding history piece, uh, bringing more of you know a pre-Oregon Trail history uh, of the West to life. And I, I, I think a lot of this uh, isn't talked about. Um, Astoria is a great story of capitalism drawing this vast Western territory that the United States gathered in the 19th century and opened the eyes and minds, starting with Astor and other people that wanted to dream and think big. Um, I'm going to add, Peter, your other book, Young Washington, to my reading list. Um, that, that'll go up, and I'll, I'll figure out a time to get to that, and I look forward to that. Um, for our if you want to talk podcast, about that, let me know. That, that has a lot of leadership issues in it, too. Young Washington's trying to figure out to be a leader in that book. So that's, if you want to talk about that, let me know. <laughs> I'll add that book to my list. For our listeners of the podcast, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. I look forward to the next episode. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much, Cole. I really enjoyed our talk. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.